Caribbean's history is as richly colored as its geography. From its birth and earliest inhabitants to the arrival of the Europeans, through its stormy battles and struggles, riddled with ancient gods and mysterious peoples, ravaged by pirates and adventurers, missionaries and noblemen. This is a land of colliding cultures and fiery passions. It's the magic of the Caribbean, and it has captivated for centuries. Crystal blue waters, sun-drenched white beaches, emerald mountains rising out of the sea. This is the Caribbean of vacation brochures and travel guides. But there's far more to the region than postcard views. The Caribbean's beauty lies in its diversity. From the tropical rainforest to savanna, from thorny woodlands and cactus scrub to mangrove swamps, it's hard to find in so small an area a greater range of tropical natural beauty. The Caribbean islands form a long, narrow chain, almost 2,500 miles long and up to 160 miles wide, connecting North and South America. Geographically, the islands fall into three major groups, the Bahamas, the Greater Antilles, and the Lesser Antilles, including the Leeward and Windward Islands. There's a growing number of people who, who believe now that the Caribbean islands actually originated in the Pacific um, in excess of 150, 160 million years ago. Uh, at that point in time, there was no Caribbean. Uh, the North America and South America were essentially uh, pushed up against one another. A piece of the Pacific moved into the area between North America and South America, prying the two, two continents apart. If you look at the, the islands from going from Cuba to Hispaniola to Puerto Rico to the Virgin Islands and then further on down, you'll notice that they get progressively smaller. And the general thinking is that these are parts of the Caribbean plate that essentially get caught up against the other side, were ripped off in that tension and left behind. Then you get into the, the Windward Islands, the Lesser Antilles, essentially east of, east of St. Thomas. and. Uh, we have primarily volcanic islands, and these are related to the eastern edge of the Caribbean where it pushes against the, uh, the North Atlantic. Islands such as Barbados and the Bahamas have coral origins. They're blocks of rock covered by limestone. They include more than 700 small islands, innumerable caves, and hundreds of reefs lying only a few feet below the surface. In the warm, clear waters, over 50 types of hard corals form the foundations of the reefs. Soft corals, such as sea fans, grow on top of them, adding color and variety. On land, plant and animal life is just as diverse. The primary reason is the trade winds. Wind coming across the ocean, which is obviously picking up moisture. Going up onto the high, into the higher elevations, up into the mountains, you get into cooler area, and because when it's cool, it tends to make that moisture precipitate. And so you tend to pick up moisture off of the east end of islands and dump it on the west ends, and that's again, is, is a function of the trade winds. Over 290 kinds of butterflies inhabit the Caribbean. Trinidad and Tobago alone support 400 species of birds. Native plants have been used in bush medicines and herbal remedies for generations, curing anything from toothaches to migraines. Uh, if you have a terrible headache, you know some people have headache, they, 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 they got a headache here to the front and the headache drop down there, a sinus headache and a malaxary headache. Well, if you have a terrible headache, you get five of these leaves and you crush them. When you finish crush them, you heat them over the stove, but don't burn them up. And when it is hot, you tie it on your forehead and tie one across here for the frontal headache. When these bush, two bush is cool, you renew them with two heated bush until you use up the all five of them. And when you use up the last five of them, you come back and tell me where the headache is gone. The Caribbean natives have always been resourceful, living in harmony with their environment. The most intriguing were the Maya of Mexico and Central America. The ancient Maya created one of the most fascinating civilizations of pre-Columbian America. It rose, flourished, and then vanished deep in the tropical rainforest, 
leaving nothing but silent ruins. An extremely advanced society, the Maya understood astronomy and positioned their pyramids to indicate the spring and fall equinoxes. Human sacrifice was an important part of their religion, often to appease the god Chakmul. The Maya also played a primitive form of basketball. Two teams competed on a court, attempting to knock a heavy rubber ball through an elevated stone hoop. The winners received a sacrificial victim, sometimes the opposing team's captain. Mayan culture also influenced other Indians who migrated throughout South America. The first peopling of the whole uh, American continent, including uh, Canada, North America, and South America, uh, began uh, 20 to 30,000 years ago and uh, they went through the Bering Strait when uh, there was, it was covered with ice so they could go by foot and cross the channel at that time and they then uh, inhabited North America and then South America so they are related by the religious thoughts and uh, some of the symbols that are found either on the petroglyphs done by the Mayans or on the, their ceramics some of the designs, the decorations, the animals that were considered as deities in the Caribbean and by the Mayans in uh, Central America are alike. So they had uh, influences from Central America, from the Mayans. They had the ball game, they had uh, many st uh, style of decorations that are really alike with Central America. On the islands, recorded history begins with the arrival of Columbus. All that we know about the native inhabitation comes from artifacts and the observations of the Europeans some of which were more fanciful than factual. Arawaks inhabited most of the islands, moving about in canoes big enough to carry 50 people. Columbus marveled at their length. The Indians introduced the explorers to pineapple, tobacco, hammocks, and rubber balls, which the Europeans had never seen before. When we are excavating, when the archaeologists are digging in the ground, we are creating artificial walls, as you see here, that we call a profile, in which you can see the different layers of deposits made by different Indians at different times. We find also broken pieces of pottery and different artifacts that helps us to identify uh, the way the Indians lived and the kind of uh, material and tools they had to live. The Arawak Indians were agriculturers and they needed uh, stone tools to cut down the big trees before planting their crops. So this is a stone axe that was polished. It's a basaltic uh, a stone that is found in the Caribbean and they polished it by grinding it on another stone like that. And uh, as you can see, it is a shiny, beautiful axe that we found on St. Martin. And it was stuck with uh, natural glue into a big stick and used like this to cut down the trees uh, before uh, planting the crops. Only about 200 years before Columbus came, uh, the, a new group of um, Indians entered the Caribbean. We call them war-like people because they did indeed conquer the, Ara the Arawaks. Uh, they were the Caribs. They came from South America, by the way, just like the Arawaks. And uh, they, their culture was based on um, war waging and domination of under, other groups. The Carib society was a male-dominated society uh, in which warfare for the purpose of obtaining captives and booty was considered preeminent. And through the history of the Caribbean, both in the terms of prehistory and colonial history. You have a recurring theme of enslavement and resistance. Certainly, slavery was not introduced by Europeans. There is very clear evidence that Native American cultures in, uh, engaged in warfare with one another and enslaved each other before the arrival of Columbus. The Caribs uh, most probably went all over the Caribbean but uh, they didn't settle. And the, their most northerly settlement uh, still in the Caribbean is in Dominica. Because the Caribbean islands lie so close to each other, 
it was easy for the native people to migrate between them, exploring from island to island. But it would take until the 15th century before the first white man ever set foot in the Caribbean. And even then, it was by accident. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with part two of The History of the Caribbean. It took Columbus eight years to secure the backing to make his trip. Several royal committees and monarchs considered his proposal before Spain finally... It took Columbus eight years to secure the backing to make his trip. Several royal committees and monarchs considered his proposal before Spain finally committed. In return for making the voyage, Columbus was supposed to receive 10% of the revenues his trip generated. Spain never delivered. But then again, neither did Columbus. He never found the westerly route to the Indies. Columbus had a rough chart uh, that described for him a place called Sipangu, which is the contemporary Japan, being some 3,000 leagues to the west of Spain. A veteran sailor, Columbus knew to head south first to catch the prevailing winds. He couldn't be sure that when he launched out, backed by what we call the trade winds today, that when he got over there, he was going to be able to find a way back. Columbus set his bearings in direction by dead reckoning. He used a magnetic compass and guessed his speed by watching objects float by. And by reckoning the distance by time, he was then able to plot his course across the ocean. And what's interesting, of course, is that he, upon desiring to return, doesn't go back this way, doesn't even go back the way that he came, but beats north, goes north, until he finds the winds that he apparently expected to be there. He first landed in the Bahamas on what is believed to be Watling Island, and there encountered some Lucayan Indians. Uh, Columbus reported them to be gentle, to be unselfish, to be giving. Uh, he rewarded all of that by kidnapping them, and eventually, of course, uh, their policies of Spain led to their destruction. On the second trip, he was commissioned to set up a trading post in Hispaniola. This time, instead of three small vessels, he commanded an armada of 17 and founded La Isabella on the northern coast of the Dominican Republic. Situated on swampy, low-lying land, the city was abandoned for better locations, among them Santo Domingo, a city of many firsts, including the first church. Word of his discovery traveled quickly. Other European powers sent their own explorers. In the four years following Columbus's discovery, more than 80 voyages were made. Maps and logs from each voyage were not shared, but became national secrets. The so-called Old World, that is to say Europe and Africa, and the New World, both North and South America, as they've come to be called, uh, were linked permanently and in an exchange, both in terms of culture, in terms of uh, biodiversity, flowed both ways. Almost immediately, the Spanish began to impose their beliefs. Missionaries accompanied Columbus on his second voyage and soon taught the Indians to read, write, and, quote, observe good customs, as well as play musical instruments for church services. But the education and conversion of the Indians came at a cost. Their potential equality in the sight of God was a threat the Spanish insisted on the natural inferiority of Indians so they could justify the Indians' enslavement. There was great debate in, not only among religious circles, but in uh, secular, non-religious circles, about whether Indians were indeed truly human beings. And that debate centered on the issue of whether Indians had souls. It was said by the Queen of Spain that uh, they should leave the Indians in, in peace except the cannibals and the Indians that were, had not a Christian way of living. So this is why most of the Indians in the West Indies were called cannibals so that it gave them the right to kill them or to, to bring them to slavery. 
A scenario destined to repeat itself began on a number of islands. First, an expeditionary force explored the island and searched for gold. Any rebellious Indians were enslaved or killed, and a brief gold rush followed. A few years later, with the mines exhausted, the settlers moved on. Hundreds of thousands of Indians died, some from overwork, some from collective suicide. What really conquered this part of the world was smallpox. Uh, you see, the Spaniards brought smallpox to this part of the world. Uh, Columbus and Act et al, Amer Amerigo and all the rest of them. And this part of the world, especially the Amerindians, had no resistance to small, smallpox at all. They were a totally virgin people. And of course, when smallpox hit them, they died like flies. Islands that had gold became Spanish settlements. Those without gold were raided to supply more Indian slaves. For instance, the Bahamas were completely depopulated. Well, the Spanish, uh, for the most part, were not interested in agriculture. They were only interested in acquiring or exploiting ready mineral wealth, that is to say, silver and gold. None of the lesser Antilles from St. Croix to Trinidad had that type of mineral wealth to exploit. There were some silver and gold mines in Puerto Rico, some in Hispaniola, and of course, much more in Central and South America. As a consequence, the Spanish focused their efforts there in, in those regions where ready mineral wealth could be exploited. Ultimately, the Caribbean became a way station for riches shipped from the mainland. Settlements on the main trade route were fortified. If you see a Spanish fort, assume this was a stop on the main trade route. The, the Pope formally, uh, you could say, gave uh, the Americas to Spain. So uh, once you sailed up to the Caribbean, you first of all already entered Spanish territory, but once you slipped through the islands into the Caribbean Sea, then you were in a Spanish lake, so to say, yeah, Spanish inland sea in their eyes. So you had absolutely no rights to be there as a non-Spanish um, boat. Spain controlled the Caribbean. To break their monopoly of trade, European adventurers began to attack Spanish shipping. No one did more to hasten the decline of the Spanish Empire than Sir Francis Drake. The greatest uh, episode in the history of piracy was Drake's overland attack on Cartagena. Uh, Drake actually captured the city and sacked it before uh, having to withdraw, uh, having quote unquote singed uh, the King of Spain's beard. Certainly signaled to other European powers, the French, the Dutch, who were also engaged in piracy and privateering activities, the signal that the Spanish were no longer uh, immune from this sort of attack, even in their strongholds. For the next 100 years, a rogues gallery of pirates sailed the Spanish main. The pirate Blackbeard was as eccentric as he was notorious. He braided his beard with colorful ribbons then accented the look with cords of slow-burning hemp. His favorite drink was a mixture of rum and gunpowder, and he was married to no less than 14 women. Anne Bonny fought with a ferocity that could match any man. She sailed with another woman, and together they became known as the Bloody Sisters. When their ship was attacked, her drunken husband and his men hid below, leaving the women to fight alone. Anne was captured, but escaped being hung by pleading she was pregnant. As for her husband, he went to the gallows with Anne's benediction. Had you fought like a man, you need not have been hanged like a dog. During the 1660s and 70s, Port Royal was one of the world's richest and wickedest cities. Located near Kingston, Jamaica, the pirates openly flourished there for two decades attacking Spanish treasure ships that sailed past their coast. 
Port Royal was destroyed by an earthquake in the late 17th century and slid beneath the sea. Port Royal's most famous citizen, Sir Henry Morgan, plundered ships throughout the Caribbean. But he didn't confine his activities to the high seas. He sacked whole settlements in Cuba, Venezuela, and Panama. The British eventually arrested him, but in a surprising stroke of luck, he gained the favor of the king, was knighted, and returned to Jamaica as lieutenant governor. Morgan is interesting also in that he used his, the wealth acquired in his years of piracy to establish a legitimate political base or power structure on the island of Jamaica. And paradoxically, in his later years, actually was in the position to have to prosecute pirates. While gold put the Caribbean on the map, it was sugar that built the economy. The climate was perfect for growing sugar cane. For the next 250 years, the Caribbean's fortunes rose and fell with the price of sugar. The great sugar plantations were established in the early days of English colonization, the late 1600s. A cheap workforce was needed, and African slaves were imported to meet the demand. When the slave trade finally ended, over four million Africans had come to the Caribbean, changing the islands forever. Growers produced two products, muscovado, a coarse sugar, and molasses, which was used in the making of rum. The potential profits from successful trading voyages were enormous. Sugar became virtually as good as gold, and the island's economies flourished. Well, you must remember that in the 17th and 18th century, sugar was a very expensive commodity and a great luxury. And the planters in Jamaica, the sugar planters, made a great deal of money. They didn't make very much sugar. They would make it by the hogshead rather than by the ton. But uh, they made an enormous amount of money nonetheless. The planters and their wives instead lived a life of luxury, especially in terms of social life, entertainment, glittering dinners and soirees and balls, uh, great houses filled with exquisite uh, mahogany furniture crafted in Europe or in North America. The West Indies were considered so economically valuable because of their produce of sugar, molasses, rum, cotton, tropical hardwoods, that, for example, at the end of the Seven Years' War, France, as the loser of that war, was willing to cede all of French Canada to the British to retain one island in the West Indies. They considered one sugar-producing island of the West Indies to be more valuable than all of French Canada. The richest colony of them all was France's Haiti. It alone provided more profit to its mother country than all of England's 13 American colonies. But changes occurred and the prosperity ended. The Americans freed themselves from the British. The French overthrew their own monarchy. Liberty, equality, and fraternity reigned. But nothing changed for the slaves in Haiti. Slavery in Haiti was more brutal than most. And it was as a result of that long-standing repression and brutality that caused the slaves in Haiti to plan an insurrection which by its magnitude caught the French in Haiti completely unprepared. And under the leadership of Toussaint L'Ouverture defeated French forces. Toussaint L'Ouverture even governed Haiti for a while before Napoleon sent thousands of battle-tested troops to retake the island. Toussaint's army was overwhelmed. Although he didn't live to see it, the rebellion Toussaint L'Ouverture led became the first slave uprising in history to achieve freedom, and Haiti became the first nation in the Caribbean. Over the next 50 years, slaves were freed throughout the Caribbean. Sugar production declined, and when German scientists found a way to extract sugar from sugar beets, 
profits fell. Sugar could now be produced more cheaply on the continent and consumed without shipping. With its gold reserves exhausted and sugar less profitable, the Caribbean dwindled in importance. At one time, the region had produced the most prized colonies on the planet. Now only Cuba still contributed to its mother country's treasury. Colonialism was ending, and a new era was about to begin. Stay with us. History of the Caribbean will continue. One event sparked American interest in the Caribbean, the building of the Panama Canal. Suddenly, the islands became important to the canal's defense. And as the military focused on the region, business soon followed. American capitalists rebuilt the sugar, banana, and coffee industries. Their commercial interests, however, led to intervention in Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. An explosion on the main, a U.S. ship anchored in Havana Harbor, ignited the Spanish-American War. Teddy Roosevelt, having served as the uh, uh, Secretary of the Navy, resigned to form his own volunteer mili militia group of cavalrymen, consisting, uh, I believe, mostly of cowboys from his days when he served as a cowboy in the Badlands of the Dakotas and recruited them to form his military group, which was known as the Rough Riders. The United States blockaded Cuba and soon trapped Spain's Caribbean fleet in Santiago Harbor. Then the Rough Riders closed in from the hills surrounding Santiago. The Spanish admiral tried to run the American blockade and his squadron was destroyed. The war marked the end of Spain's colonial empire and the beginning of the American when the U.S. received Puerto Rico as a war reparation from Spain. The United States acquired its second Caribbean territory during World War I. President Wilson convinced Congress the Germans were going to receive the Virgin Islands in a swap with Denmark. The United States was especially concerned that the Germans, if they were to acquire the Danish West Indies, would then convert St. Thomas Harbor into a large naval and especially U-boat base and cut off the Caribbean approaches to the Panama Canal, which had just been opened in 1914. In order to preempt the Germans, the United States made the Danes an economic offer they could not refuse and uh, acquired the islands by purchase, uh, the transfer going through on March 31st, 1917, less than two weeks before the United States' formal entry into World War I on the side of the Allies. St. Thomas was originally established as a free port by the Danish crown, and the United States had to maintain the island's duty-free status as part of the purchase agreement. That's why travelers from St. Thomas still have to pass through customs before entering the U.S. mainland. One of the first ports of call in the Caribbean was the Bahamas, which were visited by steam passenger ships at the end of the 19th century. Combination crews and cargo ships were the only contact with the outside world for many of the islands. People came um, to the Virgin Islands in big steam cruise ships, steam liners, that they even had a coal depot at West Indian docks that when these steam boats came in, you had women and men actually carrying coals that was stored down there at West Indian Company warehouses to fuel, refuel these ships. Four weeks would often pass before the next ship arrived. The islanders would put on their finest clothing and row out to the ships to dance, share drinks, and be photographed. In the early 20th century, banana boats began bringing passengers into Jamaica. It was the United Fruit Company that really started tourism. When they started banana trading, they ran boats, very nice boats, both to England and to America. In fact, when I was young, the only way to get to England or America was by a banana boat. They were very well run. And um, they built the first tourist hotels here. In fact, several hotels sprang up to accommodate the ever-increasing number of visitors. The luxury ones became trendy vacation spots for luminaries such as Clara Bow and Errol Flynn. 
World War II's greatest effect in the Caribbean was on tourism. The U.S. had taken control of military bases on several British West Indies islands in exchange for 50 American naval destroyers. Military engineers had constructed barracks, fortified harbors, and extended airport runways. Returning American soldiers told wonderful stories of the island's beauty. What is significant about um, the World War II in the Caribbean was that those very same American lend-lease bases from the British, especially the air bases and the naval ports, formed the basis in the early 50s for the fledg fledgling tourist industry to the West Indies. Airlines began making use of the military runways. Ships began to specialize in cruises alone, and the islands began to promote tourism. Ultimately, jets made travel faster and less expensive, enabling the industry to develop further from the U.S. mainland. Explorers still come to the Caribbean, only now they're armed with cameras, and their interest is recreational the islands they discover already have names and nationalities all their own. The Caribbean region now consists of independent states, associated states, and colonial dependencies. Whatever their current status, the island's early influences remain. The modern Caribbean is a dynamic collision of cultures, African, Asian, European, Native American, and American. Creole, the blending of old traditions on new soil, is standard practice in every island's culture. And Creole languages are found on most of the Caribbean islands. English was the dominant language at the time here. And then, of course, you had the Africans being brought in from West Africa, and they spoke um, their own tongues. And then they incorporated some of their words and um, French words, English words, and they came up with this language was called a Dutch Creole. And the planters themselves and the owners of the estates and their overseers could not understand this language. The Creole languages are used for informal communication and serve to bond each island's populace together. Accents and inflections differ. The English you hear on Barbados sounds different from the English in Jamaica. And the music you'll hear will be just as different. The sheer musical diversity of the Caribbean is unequaled. Virtually every country or island has its own song and dance style. Ska, zouk, cottons, merengue, calypso, soca, or the most popular Caribbean music in the world, reggae, to name just a few. The thing that makes Caribbean music fascinating is the combination of the Western influences, the European influences, and the African influences. These things found their way to the Caribbean and got blended somewhat differently on each island and come up with this wonderful mix that we refer to as, as Latin or Caribbean music. But the music is based not from the bottom up, like Western music. You don't have a bass part that is embellished with chords and a melody, but it's embellished from the top down, from the rhythm. when everybody thinks of African music, they think of the drums. This drum here is, is, is from Ghana. And notice the similarities between this Ghanaian drum and this drum, which is, of course, uh, commonly referred to as a conga drum. And many people feel that conga came from the Congo. Of course, the one thing that makes the music distinctive from straight African music are the harmonic and melodic influences of the Western music that came from Europe. Just about any music from any island will have that clave influence. Clave sounds like this. Calypso music, for instance, is just the three without the two.
And you have to understand uh, something about Calypso music as well. Um, being that they could not play drums, the Africans living here in the Danish West Indies at the time, drumming was outlawed because that was a form of communication. So they would make up a song. Say something happened on the plantation today. Say the master, master John was riding a horse and a horse threw him over and he landed on prickle pear cactus or sucker cactus. And these sucker cactus, they penetrate your skin, okay? So you know Master John was in a lot of pain today, so what they will do is they make up a calypso, a song, and then I'll sing the song to you. So you're gonna take the song with you, and there's a form of communication. Spread it like a newspaper. That's how calypso was formed. The steel pan, or steel drum, produces the sound most closely associated with calypso. The festival most closely associated with Calypso is Carnival. The streets fill with ritual dancers and stick fighters, traditional costumes and characters. Since I'm a retired former Mukujumbi dancer, where I dance on stilks, but that art form came from West Africa. And Muku means seeker, a seeker of good and a seeker of evil as well, but you would outcast the evil and bring in the good. Trinidad has the largest and best known of the carnivals in the Caribbean. The Protestant islands tend to have a Christmas festival, commonly called Junkanoo. It combines West African characters with traditional English masked dancers or mummers. Over the centuries, the Caribbean has captivated millions of travelers. Its beauty is timeless. These are the waters that Indians crossed. Columbus sailed, and Drake fought for. And now you are part of that continuing tradition. The Caribbean's a place apart, where vestiges of the past resonate into the future. You'll hear it in the African rhythms and the English accents. See it in the Spanish churches and the New England-style houses. Taste it in the French sauces and Irish liqueurs. Immensely diverse, constantly changing, the Caribbean's a mixture of new ideas and new combinations. Here, people are free to adapt and experiment. And you are now part of the rhythm, an influence, a participant. You don't just visit the Caribbean. You become part of it, and it becomes part of you. Look around and take it in. The memories await.